Okay, hey guys, this is Justine here again, and um, what we're going to do today is go over rights in Frisetta, because we've just gone over my work and how they organize details. Bernie Wrightson was really famous for doing his um, Frankenstein illustrations. I think it was a, actually a Marvel release, but it wasn't in comics format. So the big question is, how does Wrightson organize these details, which are pretty an astounding amount of details, in a way that makes sense? The first thing you notice in this drawing is you, you immediately know where to look first. There's, there's no question in your mind. Even with all the things going on in the drawing, we all know to look right here. Um, well, how does he do this? Well, there's the obvious. This white window leads us right down to the main character, doesn't it? Just points right to him, right? So that's significant. Another thing that's significant is that um, these areas of darkness are surrounding him. Look at this. So he's sort of isolated in this island. So these foreground elements, while they over, overlap the middle ground elements, they don't actually create chaos because of this bit of black in between. And when the little um, you know, symbols in the bottom disappear, you'll be able to see that. So you see how the foreground elements overlap but not do not directly create chaos by all jumbling together, by having that bit of black in between. So we've got the black in between the levels, and then we've got that beautiful white going from the, the ceiling light all the way down to the window where his head is. You notice also that behind his head, there are really no details. There are just a couple of planes where the top of the window and the side of the window and the windows themselves meet, right? So that's significantly important. Now, what else is going on here is that um, we have all of this area here, as detailed as it is, it really becomes a pattern, a pattern of diagonal lines that are all rendered the same way, up and down, you know, diagonally, up and down, diagonally. So that creates, again, a bit of a pattern that recedes. Now, imagine this drawing had this bookshelf been be placed behind this head. It would have been very difficult to read that head. It would have been difficult to find that head. It would have been difficult to work out the space. Wrightson knew that and chose to put something fairly simple behind. Notice also that the white comes down here, it's here, and it's here. So this white creates almost like a halo that runs all the way around the primary figure. So he has done a lot of things to guide your eye to the figure. These details have become a pattern, therefore they recede. This white leads down to the character. This black circles the figure and separates these layers of space, and the whitest whites revolve in a circle around the primary figure of Dr. Frankenstein. He's done the same trick here. Look how this white comes right down here and leads you to Frankenstein's head. Notice that there are no books around his head. Notice the spiral back here. See that? Also, see how this this black is like an arrow pointing right to his head into the chair. But back to this spiral here that's round, that's round like the human. All these books are vertical and horizontal. All these books are vertical and horizontal. They create a pattern, just like these planks back here create a pattern. These create a pattern as well. But his head and body is in front of this beautiful art shape and it's isolated around this white. Similarly, when we come over to this guy, notice how there's a break in the books here, and there's a break in the books here. So he's framed by this empty space, which really creates a nice sense of uh, uh, clarity, right? You can find him immediately. Notice we've also got these round shape, round shape, round shape, round shape, and the round shapes of the skulls, and then the round shape here. So all these round shapes kind of gathered in such a way that they all kind of link up together and connect everyone together. So I think you can see that twice in a row, Wrightson has used the same trick of using this white to lead us, isolating the heads, and turning the background elements into like a pattern. And even the jumble of books in the foreground becomes almost a pattern. And he does also include some size variations, right? They're, not everything is the same size. The books in the background are all about the same size. The books in the foreground are all about the same size. But the front plane of the desk is quite a bit larger. The front plane of the globe is quite a bit larger. The back of the chair is quite a bit larger, as are the window shapes. So both of these drawings, the details are essentially organized in the same manner. In a sense, ditto here. A few other tricks are being used. For example, line weight up here. The bold line weight around these really pops. This highlight and then this dark 
the darkest dark and the lightest light together are in the areas where you want the most attention. Back here, it goes into a pattern again. It goes gray. Back here, around the figure, it's gray and white. We don't have a jumble of nonsense around the figure. He uses an area of rest. Similarly, the monster himself is on a white table with no rendering. This monster is a white table with no rendering. These lines are straight up and down vertical, so they create a pattern and recede narratively. They, of course, are in the foreground in the image, but as far as the narrative importance, they pull backwards. Similarly, notice how this points down to the figure, how these all kind of point down to the figure, and how this figure is isolated in black, just as this figure is isolated in white, and how the great highlights here, notice the highlights here are really rich and intense, and notice how much more minimal the highlights are all the way around. So it's essentially using the same tricks here over the course of about three drawings. This one what we've got is this really strong vertical here, right? And then you've got really, really faint, washed out images in the background, washed out images even for this background figure. But notice suddenly how much more lively the lines are, how everything's moving, everything's moving in different directions. Notice the sharp diagonals moving here, which really pop off of all of these strong verticals, right? And also you've got this figure isolated in a lot of white. And even the arm, which breaks in the foreground here, is highlighted in white, so it pops up off the tree. It's really quite brilliant. And then look at the deep shadows below. So the details in this are largely in the rendering of the fabric, and the rendering of the background figure, and the rendering of the trees. But everything is very selective. Look how many places he's deciding not to say much of anything. He's not saying a lot here. He's not saying a lot here. And look how down here, everything becomes a bit of a pattern of that angular grass. So Ryson is, again, using patterns, using white space, and using his highlights to leave behind. This one is an even more, it's times the detail, but the detail is in the rendering of like objects. So once again, the boards above the head of the monster become a pattern. All the lines are moving in the same direction. The boards to the left of the monster also create a pattern all moving in a horizontal direction. The slate stone behind him also recedes, and the grass, as detailed as it is, every blade of grass, deliciously drawn, also becomes a pattern of grass. So it also recedes. So he's using a pattern here, a pattern here, a pattern here, and a pattern here. They're not, of course, traditional patterns as in, like, you know, flowers or plaid or something, but the similarity of rendering creates the sense of patterning to us visually so that this, where there's no pattern and everything is rendered in detail in three dimensions, really, really pops. Another great one from the same series. And this one's even easier to figure out because, um, you know, our eye immediately goes here because our brightest highlights are here and our darkest darks are behind them, totally receding. But notice this as well. You know, this white back of um, Dr. Frankenstein against this really gray, really dark gray area. Notice how minimal the highlights back are back here and how as we go deeper into space, the highlights minimalize even more. And up here, notice how much less dark it is and how much more reliant it is on highlights. And notice also in this case that there are some pretty clearly defined layers. A lot of the same stuff's going on here, but Wrightson's using other tricks to lead the eye to the main character. This is again, pattern, 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 pattern. Notice this diagonal all the way through the picture, which leads you to the main figure, you know, balanced out by this great white rock. Notice how these, this all leads to the figure, this leads to the figure, this leads to the figure, this diagonal leads to the figure, and all these lines lead to the figure as well. So the figure is also isolated. Look at how there's a bit of white floating around the figure. Granted, that probably wouldn't happen in real life, right? But sometimes as artists, we have to edit real life to make it more readable. But Bryson makes this even more believable by not making this the only instance of the white halo. There's white here, there's white here, and there's white here. So that's another way to make your details more believable. If you need to isolate an area by creating you know, a bit of a white halo around it, it's a really good idea to reflect some of that white halo elsewhere. Otherwise, that's going to stick out like a, like a sore thumb, and that's going to appear as a device. He's managed to disguise this device by repeating it over here. It's pretty brilliant, actually. 
And then, of course, look how this just washes out to medium gray. And these diagonals are not the same as these. And there's that white line there as well. Plus, you've got magnificent size variations. Look at that huge rock. Look at this enormous, you know, size of the lake in the front ground. And then this wedge is sort of small. And then we break into smaller shapes back here. And then kind of a nice, long, large gray back here. So there's a lot of size variation to keep us clear on what's what and what's important. Another great right in, and he's doing a lot here. There's, there's a ton going on. Notice how the white is really right in here where the main figure is. And our only really squared off areas are right in here. Notice this black of the ship on all this white is really brilliant, leading our eye. Everything leads our eye into this area. All the turmoil looks like it's in the water, but really the center of the turmoil is here. If you look visually, this is going back to the figure. This is going back to the figure. This swirl is going around the figure. This is going back up to the head, which points right back to the figure. This is going over the back, which points right back to the figure. Everything is swirling around the main figure. Notice also that back here, he doesn't do a lot of crazy rendering. Everything's pretty much on the same diagonal direction. It is completely broken by this head with opposing diagonals here and opposing diagonals here and an opposing diagonal here. It holds together beautifully because it was planned out and executed so well. So once again, though, Ryson is using like objects, like objects. The sky is a like object, all rendered the same way. All these waves are rendered in a similar way, and all these waves become more active, but they're rendered in a similar way. And this kind of breaks things up. The rendering of this head breaks things up. The rendering of this back breaks things up. So he's doing that again, the patterning, like the books in the previous images, like the um, wood planks in the previous images, like the grass in the previous images. Ryzen frequently relies on uh, using a lot of the same thing, water rendering, sky rendering, plank rendering, to push the things backward. This was harder to read. Uh, I threw it in here because it still manages to work. It's a bit more of a challenge to look through, but it actually does work really well. And you still know right where to go. Why do you know right where to go? Well, you've, first of all, you've got a lot of strong verticals here, which kind of play out through. But notice how this leads to the monster's head. This leads down here to the arm in this moment of tension. Look at that. This leads here. This leads here. This swatch of white leads here, and it's an empty space, a break between the monster and his creator. This white against this black really pops. See that? Those, two, those are the two highest contrast areas, and that's the densest black and the whitest white, and they're playing off of each other. Again, the whitest white and the densest, densest black are playing off of each other. Also notice that our strongest diagonals are where the action is, or leading to the action. Almost everything else is a jumbled up uh, spatial relationship between horizontals and verticals. Okay, so now we're moving to Frazetta. Now granted, I've stacked the deck, and I've used a lot of images that um, make my point for me. But I think if you look through these images, you'll see, yes, they do use other ways to organize their details, and yes, they do break things down a bit, but quite frequently you'll begin to see that they routinely use the same techniques. So what does Frank Frazetta do? All right, like rights in. A lot of like objects here. And see a lot of likeness stuff back here in the sky, a lot of like up here except for this wonderful, you know, shape. So notice how back here, though, the details blur out. The details blur out. The details are blurred out. There is, in a sense, in essence, a rhombus where our main details are focused. And look at how intensely and richly detailed everything is in this diamond area. That's what Frazetta does over and over again, in this case in a rhombus. He uses these rhombuses and diamonds quite frequently. Uh, so he isolates his details in a central area and really goes to town in this area. And as we spiral out, the details get less and less. So isolating your details selectively, that's another way to go. Totally different than Wrightson's approach. Totally different than my approach of putting things in layers. Same thing, Frazetta once again has created a bit of a diamond or rhombus shape, where the primary details are focused right here in the center, and as we come around, 
he establishes dominance by going a little less detailed here and a lot less detailed back here. Notice in the background of these rosettas and in the foreground, there's still a sense of threat. They don't need to go into full detail to make that alligator threatening. They don't need to go into full detail to make those monsters threatening, right? So he's just sort of spotlighting all of his details in one central area. And this is one of the reasons that lesser fantasy artists fall apart, like maybe Rowena or Boris. Is that they don't control the space as well. They don't organize their details. Everything gets really flatly lit. Same thing is going on here. That sky is really moody and really intense, but it goes backwards because there's not a lot of detail going on. He saves his details for the central area. And it's richly, richly detailed, richly detailed, but it's centralized. Ditto this one. In fact, even the horse is not equally detailed throughout, or the elements of the horse are not de equally detailed throughout. Look at the background also, very flat, the foreground, very flat and loose. Then you look at the horse's legs, also very flat and loose. Look at the horse's tail, very flat and loose. He really saves his details for this rhombus shape again. Notice that? It's frequently this sort of rhombus -y sort of shape where he manages to put his details. I think primarily because, you know, the details are, are arranged on these diagonal axes, which can be very dramatic even as a still image. But he really goes to town into the fine details here. If you look at this area compared to down here, what a world of difference. Got the same thing going on here. Actually, that mountain is pretty well detailed, but it just offers a nice balance. We've got these great highlights on the guy, too. But if you look over here and over here, it seems kind of detailed, but it's pretty loose comparatively. It's pretty loose here and pretty loose here. But once again, in this case, though, he's not really doing a raw Well, I guess it's sort of still sort of a trapezoidal shape. Um, trapezoids, rhombuses. You know, you can see that all the details are really locked into this area, which is really catches the eye. I mean, every muscle is detailed. Every muscle is detailed. Every trinket is detailed. It's really delicious. Look at this head. But this head is far more detailed than this rock. A lesser artist would have put way more detail than that's necessary here. You really want the eye to go here. It's also, you know, a perfect arrangement of lights against blacks, lights against darks. I mean, that really helps as well. And, you know, hot colors against cold colors to create things that pop forward and recede. But what we're really focusing on is the arrangement of the details. Notice how much more detailed the foreground figures are than the background figures are. Notice they're grouped. You've got three women grouped in the foreground, three women grouped in the background at different levels of detail. You've got the tigers an intense level of detail, and then those intense red curtains just sort of creating, they pop for their redness, but they recede in the narrative because there's very little detail on them. Notice again, the sky is very loose. Notice we start getting around in here. Notice how things start to get obscured. Look at this. Look at how every detail of this is rendered, and yet so little of this is rendered, right? Look how every detail is rendered back here, and so little here. Every detail here, so little here. Right? So once again, we've got this sort of trapezoidal shape in which Frazetta has kept all of his details. So that's the Frazetta technique. You see it consistently. He is basically just choosing which areas to go to town on and letting the rest get loose and letting the less get airy. This draws our eye right to where we want it to go. You'll also notice the greatest amount of high intense light in this middle area and high intense darkness. Look how dark all this is against how light all this is, whereas around here things start to get more gray. Same stuff is going on here. I don't even think I have to explain it, but I will. Um, you'll notice that even the, the giant tiger, saber tooth, whatever it is. Notice that as it goes back in space, it gets less detailed. So it's really only detailed right through here. This is your detailed area, right in the center. And then the foreground gets soft, the background gets soft, and the, the you know, the right up front foreground also gets soft. 
So you can see he's doing this over and over and over again. Just like Wrightson was using certain techniques for details over and over again, and I was using certain techniques for over uh, details over and over again. So I hope this helps you to see maybe how different artists use to organize their details and gives you some ideas about how to organize your details. And you'll be pulling from either the way I organize details or the way Wrightson organizes details or the way Frazetta organizes details for your next homework. Good luck, you guys. Have fun. And once again, you know, let's talk about these videos. Let's not just watch them and draw. You know, throw in some observations. Let me know what clicked with you. Let me know maybe if I've missed something. Let me know what really helps you out. Thanks. Bye.